Good morning and welcome to the Sunday worship experience of the Gilfield Baptist Church. It's Father's Day and so we wish every father both by blood and by spirit and example a happy Father's Day. Indeed, this is a Father's Day that we will never forget, at least not for a generation. We've never been in the midst of a pandemic of this magnitude in over a hundred years. And so today's message will reflect the difficulty of being a godly father in a fallen world. Happy Father's Day. May the music and the message minister to our hearts.
preparation for today's scripture lesson, I invite you to turn to the book of Job, the first chapter, beginning at verse 18. And while that servant was still speaking, another servant came to Job and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped. Then Job arose and tore his robe, shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshiped. Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. The word of God for the people of God. All praise be to God.
pray. And now, God, may the words of our mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I want to tag this text, The Challenge of a Godly Father. In this passage of scripture, Job's story is told around the world in a lot of different cultures and traditions. We discuss the patience of Job. We're convinced of the righteousness of Job. We are all familiar with the sufferings of Job. But on this particular day, Father's Day, I want to look at the challenges to a godly father. I know that not everybody can celebrate Father's Day, not so much because of the same reasons that it's difficult for us to celebrate Mother's Day. Perhaps over the last eight to 10 weeks, your father, your beloved father is no longer with us. The pandemic, and the sickness because of that has come and snatched from you someone so beloved. Perhaps your relationship with your father has never been solid. In fact, there isn't really much of a relationship at all. Perhaps your father died before you were born so all you have are pictures and remembrances told by your family and friends. Perhaps your father didn't stick around at all. Maybe you're a better parent as a result of your experience. Maybe this Father's Day is one where you are to your children what you never had, or you are to your children the great example and role model of fatherhood that you experienced. Whatever it is, it is to be sure that on this particular Father's Day, at this time in human history, we're faced with a difficult time, not just a pandemic that affects our bodies, but this time where the virus of hatred and racism and injustice seem also to weigh heavy on the backdrop of human history. I was drawn to Job because if there's one thing that Job can teach us, Job can teach us not just how to be patient in tribulation, not just how to maintain our hope in God through crisis times, but Job understands Father's Day in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of a challenge, one that no father even imagines or hopes to see. In fact, there was a celebration taking place and Job was delighted that his children all loved each other and got along so well that they were celebrating their eldest brother's house. We're not told what the celebration was. We just know that they were having a good time. It's wonderful to have a reason to celebrate. And yet in the midst of their celebration, a servant reports to Job that his cattle, the basis of his economic security had been wiped out, that his land, no longer usable and unable to be cultivated. And now the messenger comes and says, this Father's Day is not going to be like the others. All of your children are dead. Everyone in the house killed. I was able to escape to tell you. Job does not display the outward signs of cultural mourning as it was for an ancient in his time at the news that his financial wealth is gone, but at the news of his emotional wealth, the heartstrings 
those who are reflections of him in 10 different angles, dead. This isn't a happy Father's Day for Job, and indeed there may be a father, indeed all of us in this time are not celebrating and are not as happy as we could be because our sons and our daughters are dead. They've been killed. Oh, it may not be that our sons and our daughters who share our DNA have been killed, but collectively our children are dead. And on this Father's Day, we lament the death, the brutality, the injustice, the mistreatment of our sons and our daughters. And we cry. In the midst of a pandemic, we weep and we don not the neckties and the t-shirts given to us by our children on Father's Day that don't match any other article of clothing that we have, but yet remind us that we're loved. No, the greeting card companies didn't have to pull out special orders for this particular weekend, but this Father's Day is a very different Father's Day. For we grieve, our hearts are heavy at the news that is portrayed before our eyes seemingly day after day. Our sons and our daughters are dead. And it's not just because of the pandemic, and it's not just because of police brutality, and it's not only in the sense of a physical death, but it's the sociological death. It's the death of a young person whose dreams are snuffed out before they can really take off to fly because injustice says that their school system based upon the zip code in which they were born and live and have been raised is not equipped to cause them to achieve their dreams and achieve the learning so that they can apply themselves to being productive, positive individuals who reflect a proud family and make for a good society. We lament today because our children are dead, because their dreams are dead, because the possibilities will never be realized. And I, I know, I know Job is one of those figures in the Bible like in those stories that we would read as children and the last page and the last sentence would say, and they lived happily ever after. And fortunately, the end of Job's story is not the conclusion of his story, but nonetheless, how is Job ever able to get over the death of his sons and daughters in this moment? And no matter what reform, no matter what changes we make, no matter what we come to grips with as a society, no matter what labels we place on our person, on our vehicles, on our property, no matter what marches we take, nothing can bring back the death and the dead of our children, our progeny. Nothing can ever make that right again. No amount of legislation, no amount of protests. And yet in that moment, Job teaches us that there's sometimes when all you can do is cry. So I want to give permission to those of you who are grieving the death of your sons and your daughters. It's okay to cry. And I know that in certain cultures, we're told that men can't cry. But here Job weeps and he laments. And no, he's not donning the t-shirt given to him by his children on Father's Day. You know, number one dad, super dad. Dads are the greatest. And we are. 
but he dons sackcloth. And he's not made up with any of the colognes or face creams, aftershave lotions that so many of you have received today. Maybe you couldn't because the quarantine and safer at home re restrictions meant that we don't even get the usual soap on a rope. No, Job paints himself in ashes so that when others see him, they see somebody who's hurting and he tries to make manifest the pain on the inside so that people on the outside will see his hurt and his anguish. And I would suggest to the godly fathers who are watching this, it is not that we don't have faith in a God who's real and in a God who's living, but we're hurting and the hurt cannot be concealed, not in this moment, not ever. The, etch, the, the wrinkles that are etched in our faces and the tears, the tears that have flown, flowed from the time our head hit the pillow the time we get up, the uncertainty, the worries for our children who are alive and the worry, will they make it back home? Now, Job is a godly father. And whatever is to be said of fathers whether they profess a faith or not, there's something wonderful and special about fatherhood. And there's nothing like dad. But there's a particular challenge for the godly father. The godly father is indeed man enough to give life, to see that's carried in a womb. But a godly father sticks around and makes sure that the essentials that support and sustain life, even at his own sacrifice, even through his own anguish and pain, are there for each of his children. Job is a godly father. In fact, he has sons and daughters and he recognizes that he birthed them into a world that was not quite as idyllic. He recognized that there are forces and factors in the world that don't celebrate life. In fact, they don't celebrate God and faith. So the Bible records in Job chapter one that he made offerings to God on their behalf, just in case they had been too co-opted by the world system and somehow in their dealings left the teachings about God and forsook the instructions that they had been given as to how to live a life that honors God. Job made offerings on their behalf just in case they got too big for their britches. Job was a godly father who lived by precept and example. And the success obviously continued to the next generation. For his children are happy together and they're celebrating something, life, the day. They're celebrating. A godly father knows how to cause the family to appreciate celebrations and to appreciate the bond of family. But a godly father also experiences the trials and tribulations of life. For Job, who is considered the world's wealthiest man, the most prosperous man in God's creation. 
And yet, in a day, a day of celebration, everything is gone. His wealth is gone. His possessions destroyed. And now his sons and daughters dead. Some of you think that people of faith are never in a situation where they experience trouble. I wish that were the case. I wish I could say that being a disciple of Jesus, that life has always been easy, the road has always been smooth, and never a day of anguish and pain. But no, scripture teaches that the rain and the sunshine flow and fall on the just as well as the unjust. Nobody is exempt. And that's a good point that Job, as Satan tries to argue before God, is only a faithful, godly follower because of the possessions that he has, because of the success that he experiences. God knows Job's heart. And God knows that the blessings that Job has are because Job's heart belongs to God. But I thought you said he rent his clothes and he goes into public mourning because his children are dead. Didn't you say that that was his heart? Yes. But he has enough faith and spiritual understanding to discern his wealth, his emotional wealth, his family wealth came through him, to him, from God. And now that death has come, that enemy, that invisible enemy, that no human has been able to contain and that no human is able to cancel the appointed time of meeting. That mysterious phantom called death has taken his children and made unhappy his father's day. The challenge of a godly father is to pick up the broken pieces of the blessings around us and still see the image of God and trust in the invisible hand of God at work for us. Perhaps in his success, perhaps as his children were developing into young men and women about whom he could boast and brag and take pride and joy he discovered that they reflect gifts from a source able to do even more. That these perfect gifts that he had been given had been given from a perfect God. The challenge of a godly father is to maintain both the heartstring to those children and things that are around us that measure, seem to measure success and blessing, but also the graciousness of God. Because if the gift can be this good, imagine how much better the gift giver has to be. And he chooses his words carefully and sometimes we minimize it and we trivialize what he says. The Lord has given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it sounds churchy. It sounds religious. It sounds like what ought to be said in a moment like this. But no, it's what he has long known that his blessings have been given to him by God. And he blessed God 
when the gifts came. He blessed God when the gifts made him proud. He blessed God when he saw his children develop into outstanding, positive young people. But death has come. Perhaps the rich man's worry is poverty. But a godly man understands that the source of all wealth is not in our possessions, but it's in the hands of God. And he declares just as confidently as he affirmed that God has given to him. He says, and the Lord hath taken away. That death has robbed me of my children. Death has come and stripped me bare. And I can't go anywhere to undo it, to reverse it, to retrieve it. But I do know one thing, that even death has to kneel in the presence of God. And everything that death steals, God has a way of getting it back. Oh, we can imagine that with Job's wealth and with as many children as he had, that he had people who helped him to care for his children, to watch his children while he was away, to take care of them while he was asleep. And now they are asleep. He can't wake them. He can't go to them. But they're under the watchful eye and in the loving and all-powerful hands of the God who gave them to Job in the first place. A godly father understands that it's a challenge to love your children, but not to love them more than you love the one who gave them to us. It's why we stick around. It's why we struggle and sacrifice to support them because we recognize that it is the honor and the glory in the God who gave them to us that we struggle to demonstrate to God that if you bless me with great children, I'll bless you by being the example, God, that you are to me. So I'll stay when it gets difficult. I'll protect them even when the foes are ominous. And I'll provide even when I don't know where the next meal or dollar is coming from. I'll do the reflection and follow the example of the God who provides for us, who protects us. And in the midst of life's pandemics, gives us a cure to our ailing spirits. The challenge is that he could have walked away. The challenge is that he could have been self-absorbed. The challenge is that Job discovers that there is greater investment in his relationship with God than his entanglements with his materials. He understands that if he's going to build a successful relationship with his family, he's got to have a solid relationship with God. That means he's got to discipline himself to study God's word, to talk to God daily, to connect with God, to communicate with God, to understand the ways of God so that he can understand the ways of his family and even in part through their encounter with him, what it must be like to have a relationship, a close relationship with the God who created us. The challenge that he now faces is that they're gone. Death has taken them away. And yet he discovers that in the same righteous and gracious hands, that gave them to him. The death had to make a 
pit stop. And while they were taken from Job by death, death could not get past God. And there is an example of praise. There is an opportunity of thanksgiving because if someone listening to this message right now has grieved the death of a child, I want to encourage you that you can't grieve without knowing that death, although has robbed you of your child, death had to make a pit stop by the presence of God. And the same God that gave you that child, death has to make a delivery. Death can't take that child away. Job says God has taken away. Really, they're in the hands of God now. Disaster has come. The house where they were is destroyed. Our hearts are forever shattered. But now they're in the hands of God. No more will they face disaster. No more will they face injustice. No more will they experience poverty. No more will they experience and succumb to the vials of a mean and cruel environment and society. They're in the presence of of God. And that doesn't really give us comfort in this moment. And Job does not celebrate. Job does not worship in a praiseworthy fashion, but he worships before God with all of his grief born bare in the presence of God. And he declares, I came into this world with nothing and I will leave with nothing, but I do have the presence of God in my life. I do have the grace that covers me. I do have the relationship that fosters me and fortifies me. The writer of Job says it best that throughout all of his ordeal and trials, Job did not sin. It means he did not abandon the principles and the precepts that he understood pleased God, that made him a godly example. Oh, it doesn't say he didn't want to lash out. It doesn't say that he didn't want to tear something up or destroy something or cause someone else to feel the pain that he was feeling and to inflict it onto them just as suddenly and ferociously as it had been inflicted on him. But it's because of the relationship with God that restrains him. Even if he were going to play the blame game, the Bible says he does not blame God. No, he discovers that God, who had given, is now the God who's the caretaker. what I love and cherish. So even though this Father's Day may not be the happiest of days, may not be one that we'll want to remember, but I want you, godly father, godly mother, follower of Jesus, wherever you are, to understand that even in life's challenges. Cling to the God who will see you through. Oh, I know the end of the story of Job kind of reads like our favorite children's story and he lived happily ever after. I'm not sure what that looks like but I guarantee that the God who sees us through the challenges of life knows how to heal us, knows how to console us, and knows how to provide exactly what we need from the hurts and the pain life might bring us. Gracious God, I pray for every person who's struggling, who's hurting, particularly every parent and most especially every father who 
struggles with the challenges of life. Give them a special measure of your comfort. Give them peace on the inside that makes itself obvious and evident on the outside. As we trust you to make our ending greater than the beginning and the prize better than the hurt. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Beloved, this month would have seen the celebration and the jubilant faces of families and friends of those who are graduating both in our congregation and in our community. Unfortunately, we're not able to host the community-wide graduation, nor are we able to recognize the many graduates within our church congregation. However, we still want to recognize the achievements, the accomplishments of all of the graduates who we embrace, whom we know, and we pray for regularly. Now, I'd like for you to help us out as we're reaching out to students who are pursuing their education. We wanna be a special blessing as the Guilfield Church family to those historically black colleges and universities located right here in Central Virginia. I know where you are, there are great needs, there are students, and you're supporting. But I want you to partner with us as we support those institutions right here help students make it through their university education successfully and on the prayers and support of the people of God, even in a pandemic. So text us at 73256 and key in the message GBCGIVE and make a note, outreach student. We'll make sure that students at those institutions, Virginia Union University and Virginia State University right here in Central Virginia, will be the recipient of the gifts from our church family and from people like you, wherever you are across the country, around the world, to help a student stay in school, stay focused, and achieve their higher education dream. Will you help us do that? God bless you, and until next time, go in peace.